It seems like every time you turn around, there's another headline about a pastor and, well, a moral failing. It's practically a buzzword now. Yeah. And just recently we saw it again with Pastor Steve Lawson in Dallas, yeah, right. Trinity Bible Church, where he was uh, let go. Mm -hmm. They put out a statement about an inappropriate relationship, but uh, details are scarce as they often are in these situations. But it definitely got people talking. Yeah. And it got me thinking about this phrase, moral failing. Mm -hmm. It's like we're, I don't know, dancing around the edges of something without really getting at it. So to really dig into this, we're doing a deep dive on an article from the Christian Research Journal by Ann Kennedy. It's titled, A Christian's Response to Pastor Lawson's Moral Failure. Okay. So what do you make of that phrase, that moral failing phrase? Yeah. We hear it all the time, but does it really capture what's going on in these situations? That's one of the first things that Kennedy kind of digs into in her article. And she makes a really interesting point, I think, that using a term like moral failing, it's almost like we're trying to avoid calling sin what it is. Hmm. The Bible doesn't shy away from strong language, right? <laughs> yeah. Like sin, adultery, these words have weight consequences. Right. And moral failing just, I don't know, it feels almost sanitized in comparison. Yeah, it's like we're tiptoeing around it a little bit, like mm -hmm. being too careful not to offend. Right. But are we also maybe minimizing just how serious it is, especially when it's coming from someone in a position of spiritual leadership. Yeah, I think that's exactly her concern. Okay. That this kind of shift in language might even point to, you know, a more casual or even accepting view of sin in general. Hmm. It's not just about individual actions, but also maybe a blurring of the lines when it comes to holiness and morality itself. So let's unpack that a bit. When Kennedy's talking about morality, what does she mean? If it's not just about these individual failings, then what is it about? She would say that true morality, in a biblical sense, it's not really about like checking boxes or being a good person on the outside. Mm -hmm. It's about aligning your heart, your mind, your whole self with God's holiness. So it's more of an inward transformation than just outward actions. Exactly. Okay. And that's what makes the consequences of straying from that, especially for someone in leadership, so much more significant. Which leads right into Kennedy's next point, yeah. that pastoral sin it's not just a personal thing. It has a ripple effect on the whole congregation. Absolutely. Yeah. And she uses this really powerful analogy from Ezekiel 34 to illustrate this point. Yeah. God condemns the shepherds in that passage who are devouring the sheep instead of caring for them. That's intense. So how does she connect that back to pastors today? What does it look like for a pastor to devour their congregation? Well, she's drawing a parallel there to pastors who might be prioritizing their own needs above the needs of the people that they're supposed to be serving, okay. abusing their power, or even misleading people through their actions. It's a betrayal of trust, really, and a perversion of their God-given role. It's a far cry from a simple moral failing, when you mm -hmm. put it that way. Right. It becomes a misrepresentation of Christ and his love for the church. Yes. And that has an impact. Huge, yeah. huge impact, a huge impact. And, you know, it's really easy to kind of look at these situations and distance ourselves. Right? Right. Like, well, I would never. I'd never do that. Yeah, I'm not as bad as. But Kennedy warns against that kind of thinking. OK. She says it actually makes us more vulnerable. Because it's that whole holier than thou attitude. Yeah, exactly. That can make yeah. us blind to our own. Our own weaknesses. Yeah, OK. She's a big proponent of humility, like really owning our own brokenness. And that, that's key to resisting temptation and also accountability, right? Yeah. Surrounding yourself with people who can speak truth to you even when it's hard. Yeah, it's about support, not judgment, which yeah. is something she comes back to again and again in the mm -hmm. article. Like mm -hmm. She talks about congregations needing to support their pastors. Yes. And not just with words, but like she gets into the specifics. Like yeah. Generous vacation time, mm -hmm. sabbaticals open communication with leadership, yeah. creating a culture where pastors feel safe to say, hey, I'm struggling. Yes. I need help. I think that's so crucial yeah. because we put pastors up on this pedestal. Right. 
But they're human. They're just as messed up as the rest of us. They face pressure and temptation just like everyone else. Right. So they need an environment where they can be open about those things. Without being afraid. Yes. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of that parable, you know, in Luke about the unworthy servant. Yes. The one where he does all the things he's supposed to. And Jesus is like, yeah, you did your duty. What do you want? A cookie. Right. It's like, that's not, I don't know. It's very countercultural. It is. We're so used to wanting credit, wanting recognition for the things that we do. Absolutely. It's a challenging passage, especially today. But, you know, she highlights how important that attitude of humble service is. Especially in the church. Yes. Because it's not about us. Right. It's about serving God, serving others. Yeah. And if we're always worried about the spotlight, we miss it. Exactly. And that goes for pastors, too. Like, they need to remember that their identity isn't rooted in what they do or their position, but in Christ. So it's not just about, you know, preventing pastors from making mistakes. Right. But about creating space for them to actually thrive. Thrive, yes. Spiritually. Yeah. Even with you know, the unique pressures they face. Absolutely. It's about fostering a healthy relationship there between pastors and their congregations. Right. Built on mutual support, understanding, you know, that shared commitment to spiritual growth. No, even with all of that, even with all the support in the world, we know people are going to mess up. Right. We're human. It's going to happen. Yeah. But Kennedy doesn't leave us there. Thankfully not. In that place of despair. She brings us back to the heart of the gospel. Okay. God's mercy and forgiveness. Yeah. She reminds us that no matter how far we strayed, how badly we've messed up. God's grace is bigger. It's bigger, always. Mm -hmm. And she goes back to Ezekiel 34 again. Okay. Specifically, the verses where God promises to break the bars of the people's yoke to deliver them from those who enslaved them. Wow. Yeah. Powerful imagery, right? It's really powerful. Because it speaks to the restoration of the congregation, but also to the potential redemption of the fallen shepherd. So it's not the end of the story. No. There's still hope. God is still at work. Exactly. Even in this. And that's a truth we all need to cling to, you know? Right. Not just in this context, but in our own lives. Yeah, and that's such a good reminder for us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to get caught up in the anger, the disappointment, yeah. When these things happen. Absolutely. Even that sense of betrayal. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Kennedy reminds us to look past those initial reactions. Yeah. To remember that God's grace is bigger than any mess we could ever make. It is. It's about holding those two things in tension. Right. You know, the seriousness of sin, but also the immensity of God's grace. Right. It's not about minimizing the hurt, but it's about recognizing that real healing yeah. and restoration that comes from God ultimately. And she's clear that it doesn't mean just like brushing things under the rug. Well, yeah. Like there's a process. Absolutely. Of repentance and seeking forgiveness and rebuilding trust. 100%. And that process involves everyone, she says. Right. It's the whole community. Yeah. It's a collective sort of yeah. coming to terms with what happened and then moving forward. Wow. In grace and truth. You know, it makes you think through this whole conversation. We've been talking about the pastor's role and the congregation's role. Mm-hmm. But where do we fit in? personally, Mm -hmm. not as pastors or churchgoers, Mm -hmm. but just as people walking our own journeys of faith, what keeps us grounded? Yeah. What are we doing in our own lives? Yeah. What keeps us accountable? Exactly. What keeps us accountable? Who are we letting speak into our lives? Right. Are we surrounding ourselves with people who can speak truth? Truth tellers. Yeah. Are we creating space for confession, for repentance, for growth? It's like she's saying this isn't someone else's problem. This is about all of us. This is all of us. Exactly. None of us are immune to temptation or to messing up. To being human. Yeah. And that's why remembering God's grace is so important. Like you said, it's not about earning our way to a clean slate. It's about recognizing that we are loved. Yes. We are pursued by God, even when we're a mess. Even when we stray. Even when we run the other way. Always running. It's what gives us the freedom to move forward. Yes. Without that weight. It's true. Of fear and shame, you know. Freedom. But with that hope and that faith. Yes. Knowing that God is working in us, even in the midst of all that brokenness. Making all things new. Mm Mm-hmm. That's good. It is good. Well, this has been one of those conversations. I mean, has. That really makes you think. A lot to unpack. It really does. It's given me a lot to chew on. Me too. I think both personally and just thinking about how we as the church can do better. At supporting each other. Yes, at supporting and caring for each other. Yeah, I think Kennedy's insights are so helpful. They are. Like she offers such a good framework for these really difficult situations. Yeah. Emphasizing 
truth and grace and accountability and compassion. All at the same time. I'm holding it all. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think it's time to wrap up this deep dive. For those of you listening, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you. We hope this conversation has challenged you, encouraged you. And given you something to think about. Give you something to think about. Yeah, maybe even left you with more questions than answers. That's okay. That's okay. But ultimately, we hope it points you back to God. The one who holds it all together. He does. The one who is making all things new. Amen. Amen.